thank you for turning me on. This is 2XL, your favorite robot buddy. Remember me? Of course you do. Or do you? You do look a little familiar, but I better check. If you have ever played this program before, press yes. If you have not ever played this program before, press no. Press yes or no now. No kidding. That's funny. I thought you looked familiar. Oh, well, I guess not even a robot is perfect. Not even me. But I try real hard. Anyway, since you have never played this program before, I must tell you, it is very different than other 2XL programs. Because in this program, you will help guide Batman through an adventure that will pit him against one of his most dangerous enemies. Remember to always follow instructions. Only press those buttons you are told to press, and only after I say the word now. The choices you make will either help the caped crusader or put him into serious danger. It's all up to you. There are so many different possible stories to explore here that I've invited a special guest narrator to help tell the story while I keep track of your choices. I'll be back when it's time for you to help decide Batman's fate. But for now, I'll turn you over to our narrator for the story called The Mystery of the Criminal Carnival. Okay, here we go. Most thieves are cowards. They hide in the shadows, waiting for the moment when no one is around to break into cars, homes, jewelry stores, or banks. And Fred Pierce was no exception. He stood in the alleyway, watching as the store clerk placed a closed sign on the window and locked the door behind him. Pierce slyly looked up and down the street to make sure it was empty. Then he stepped out of the alley and began to slink toward his destination. The sign over the shop window read, Max's Jokes and Stuff. Pierce looked at the sign a moment, took a deep breath, and began to pick the lock. Harry Bullock, Gotham City's crudest detective, was driving home from work when he noticed a light on inside Max's Jokes and Stuff store. Bullock was a regular at Max's. He liked the shop's assortment of novelties and was especially fond of the whoopee cushions he would put on Officer Montoya's desk chair whenever possible. But Max's was usually closed when he drove by after work. Was something wrong here? Hmm, tough choice for Harry. You better help him. If you think Harry should stop at the shop and see if anything unusual is going on here, press button three. If you want Harry to forget about this and keep on driving, press four. Press three or four now. <laughs> Alfred opened the secret doorway leading to the Batcave, and Bruce entered and walked down a spiral staircase before arriving in Batman's huge underground headquarters. Before him, he could see dozens of enormous caverns filled with the equipment Batman used to fight crime. When he turned the computer on, dozens of TV monitors flickered to life. On each screen was a different scene from the streets of Gotham. Batman had placed cameras at each location long ago and could now observe each location undetected. If a crime was being committed, Batman would see it and be on the scene in moments. Right now, all the screens were quiet, except one. On this screen, Batman watched Detective Harry Bullock get out of his car and sneak up to the door outside Max's jokes and stuff. The store was closed for the night, but someone was inside. Batman was curious. But just then, Alfred's voice broke in. Excuse me, sir. Sorry to interrupt, but I believe it's time for you to suit up. The bat signal has been lit. Hmm, a difficult decision. If you think Batman ought to respond to the bat signal, press button one. If you think he should watch the TV to see what Harry Bullock is up to, press button three. Please press button one or three now. <laughs> I see that Don Balloon Kamish, and I'm on the case. Just follow it. If it lands, I don't want you to move. Make sure you get back up before you try anything crazy. Back up? Me? <laughs> now who's talking crazy? Gordon started to shout, but Bullock quickly switched off the radio. He kept an eye on the armored car as it floated toward Gotham's outskirts. 
When it approached the Bronski brothers' carnival, it drifted to the ground until it was out of sight. Harry stopped his car a distance from the carnival entrance and took a pair of binoculars from the glove compartment. He was looking for the truck when he heard a tapping on the window. He gasped in surprise, only to see Batman. Oh, never thought I'd be glad to see you, Bats. But for a minute there, I thought you were one of the Joker's crew. Gee, you had me spooked there. Uh, I must be working too hard. Sorry to disappoint you, Bullock. I'm one of the good guys. But you know, you do look like you could use some sleep. Nah, I'm sticking to you like glue. Batman extended his hand to Bullock to reveal a small black marble-shaped object. Harry looked at the marble, confused. A cloud of smoke puffed out, and a second later, Harry was asleep. Sorry, Bullock, but you're better off sleeping this one out. Good thing Batman decided to put Bullock to sleep. This is no job for an ordinary detective. Now that Bullock is out of the way, we've got to help Batman make a choice. If you want Batman to check his computers before making a move, press 1. If he should go right into the carnival to investigate, press 4. Press 1 or 4 now. <laughs> All right, Bullock, I'll let you join me. But if it gets tough, I won't be there to pull your fat out of the fire. Sure, but where are we going? Batman looked at the dashboard radar scope. A pulsing dot moved up the screen. Batman knew the dot was the armored car floating over the town. He looked at Harry standing outside the Batmobile. Come on, Bats, let me in. We're teaming up on this one, right? Batman thought about it. Teaming up was one thing. But letting Harry Bullock into the Batmobile was another. There were many secret weapons stored in the Batmobile that a curious detective like Bullock would be sure to notice. And besides, Harry smelled. An interesting question. Press one to let Harry into the Batmobile. Press two if Batman tells Harry to follow the Batmobile in his own car. Press one or two now. Sorry, Bullock. If you want to tail along, that's fine. But this Batmobile's not big enough for the both of us. Batman reached into one of the Batmobile's many secret compartments and pulled out a small walkie-talkie. He handed it to Bullock. I usually use this walkie-talkie to communicate with Robin when we work together. But I guess he won't mind if I loan it to you. I just uh, press the button and talk to you? Yeah, yeah, hey, 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 wait a second, wait up there! As Batman revved the Batmobile's engines, Bullock raced back to his own car. In an instant, both were racing through the Gotham streets. Batman checked his radar scope. The further away from town he drove, the bigger the dot became. Soon, he and Bullock spotted the balloon carrying the armored car in the sky as it hovered over the Bronski Brothers' carnival site. Batman and Bullock watched as the armored car slowly drifted to the ground. There she is, Bats. I'm going in. Oh, boy. This could be a problem for Batman. Harry Bullock can be a very stubborn detective. You should press 1 if you want Batman to tell Harry to wait for him to check out the carnival with his night vision glasses. Or press 2 if you want Batman to let Harry go in. Press 1 or 2 now. Batman watched as Bullock revved his engine and blasted through the carnival's main gate. He didn't get far, though. After driving 10 feet into the parking area, Bullock's car touched a hidden landmine. With a roar, the bomb exploded, blowing the engine right out of Bullock's vehicle. Injured, Bullock staggered back to the Batmobile. <sighs> now what do we do? We do nothing. You are going to the hospital. I programmed the Batmobile to drop you off there and return here. This adventure is over for you. Batman squeezed the groaning Bullock inside the Batmobile. Just before the Batmobile roared off, he took out a walkie-talkie. Once Bullock was out of sight, he switched the walkie-talkie on. Alfred, I think I'm going to need some help here. Alfred, 
Do you hear me? A moment passed. Then Batman could hear his faithful butler's voice. Indeed, sir. And I'm happy to assist. But don't you think it would be wise to switch to a secret channel so we won't be overheard? I believe you can use either channel 3 or channel 4. Well, you heard the man. We have to switch to a secret channel. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick up your little pointer finger, aim it towards your robot, and press either button 3 or 4 now. Batman and Bullock stepped into one of the boats that floated along the shallow water pathway leading into the Tunnel of Hate. As they floated along the darkened tunnel, they could see strange images along the wall. Instead of romantic things, however, these were horrible things. Statues of monsters loomed over the tunnel, poised as if ready to attack. Bullock looked terrified. Batman could hear his teeth chattering. Don't worry, Bullock. They're just statues. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the way's that werewolf coming straight at us. Batman turned and instantly saw that Bullock wasn't seeing things. A werewolf Fangs dripping and claws swinging was charging down the water pathway directly toward them. When it was just in front of the boat, it leaped inside. Holy smokes, bats! I'm out of here! As the werewolf leaped into the boat, Bullock leaped out, splashing in the water until he could get back on his feet. Then he started to run back toward the tunnel of hate's entrance. Sorry, Bats, but this is too crazy for me. If you're smart, you'll follow me out of here. Otherwise, I'll try and come back with help. Honest. Batman couldn't flee while he had a job to do. Besides, he had other things on his mind, not to mention his neck. The werewolf was on top of him now, fangs bare and ready to bite. Batman managed to remove a sleeping gas pellet from his belt. He set it off under the werewolf's shiny black nose. But it had no effect. Nothing living could stay awake after a dose of Batman's sleeping gas. And that meant one thing. This werewolf wasn't alive. As Batman struggled with the werewolf, he noticed that one of the creatures looming over the boat wore a hood over its head and was holding a huge axe. The axe was poised just over where the boat would soon pass. If Batman could just position the werewolf in the path of the axe, he did it! The axe hit the werewolf right on the neck, cutting the head to reveal a mass of wires and circuitry. The werewolf was a robot, and Batman had short-circuited it. Batman emerged from the Tunnel of Hate on the other side, wounded and alone, but not beaten. He looked around in the darkness, planning his next move. Batman stood alone and unafraid in the center of the carnival. Once again, he put on his night vision goggles to see through the darkness. He noticed the entrances to two different carnival rides around him. Each ride had its name over the entrance, but each name had been changed into something twisted and frightening by the Joker. On Batman's left, he could see that the bumper car ride had been changed into the dumper car. On his right, he noticed that the fun house was now called the sad house. If he was going to find the Joker, he had to try one or the other. If you want Batman to decide to enter the dumper cars ride, press button three. If you think he'll have more luck inside the sad house, press four. Press three or four now. <laughs> Batman looked at the sign over the entrance. The word fun had been crossed out, and the word sad had been written next to it. So he was going into the sad house now. Hopefully it would turn out to be a sad experience for the Joker. Batman took a deep breath and stepped into the darkness. As soon as he did, a bright spotlight shone into Batman's face, blinding him. He blinked, trying to get his vision back. And when he did, he was face to face with the Joker, or at least the Joker's head. It was around 10 feet tall, and it floated in the air in front of Batman, cackling gleefully. 
Welcome to the Joker's sad house, Bat Boy. Hope you enjoy being unhappy as much as I love making you that way. <laughs> Batman swung at the head, but his hand simply passed through it as though it wasn't there. It was a hologram. In an instant, the head disappeared, only to be replaced by a dozen Batmen. But while each of them wore the same cape, mask, and costume as Batman, they looked nothing like the genuine article. Some were short and fat. Others were tall and skinny. There was even one or two that were tall and fat. Batman smiled to himself. He couldn't be frightened this easily, not by a bunch of crazy funhouse mirrors. Hmm, this might not be as simple as it looks. We better help Batman make a decision here. If you want Batman to take a good, close look at the mirrors, press 2. Or if you want Batman to take his batarang and smash the mirrors right now, press 4. Press 2 or 4 now. Batman stepped forward to get a closer look, and then a short, fat Batman punched him on the chin. Batman stumbled backward. The pain in his jaw told Batman these funhouse images must be real. The tall, skinny Batman grabbed him by the cape and spun him around. Then he pushed Batman backward as a short, skinny Batman kneeled behind the cape crusader. Gloved fists came raining down on him from all directions, and Batman started swinging. First, he connected with a fat, bearded jaw. Then he punched a soft, mushy stomach. Bat men were falling every moment now, but there were just too many of them. If he wanted to get out of the sad house alive, Batman had to think fast. The fake Bat men were too close for Batman to use his batarang, so Batman reached into his utility belt and removed the last of his sleeping gas grenades instead. He threw it to the ground and held his breath. When the puff of sleeping gas filled the room, the Bat men never knew what hit them. One by one, they dropped to the ground, fast asleep. Soon, the room was quiet, except for the snores of the sleeping imposters. All right, Joker. So much for your mirror trick. Why don't you come out and settle this once and for all? The air in front of Batman shimmered and the face of the Joker reappeared. Ah, oh, Batman, what's the matter? Aren't you enjoying yourself? Don't you want to find out why I call this the sad house? Allow me to demonstrate. <laughs> Suddenly, the floor below Batman's feet disappeared. Batman slid down a long, slippery ramp. Batman tried to get a grip on the walls to slow down, but he couldn't. He suspected that whatever was waiting for him at the end of this ramp wouldn't be much fun. When he heard the roar of a ferocious lion in the distance, he was certain of it. Quickly, he removed a pair of suction cups from his utility belt. He could see a light at the end of the tunnel. In seconds, he'd be face to face with the lion. He held under the suction cup handles and slapped them against the walls. They skidded, but they held, and not a second too soon. Batman was mere feet from the tunnel opening. A deadly paw swung into the hole, ripping Batman's cape. But the lion could not follow up the slippery ramp as Batman slowly made his way back to the surface. When he got there, the Joker and his Batman were gone. As Batman emerged from the ride, he came into an open area that announced two new attractions. On the left was a sign with an arrow pointing into the darkness. Originally, it had said, Roller Coaster, but someone had changed it to Roll Over Coaster. On the right was a sign that read simply, The Whip. Batman recalled that ride from his youth, but he knew that with the Joker in charge, it would be very different from the ride he remembered. Batman decided he wasn't going to try either of these rides. But then, he heard the sound of a woman's screams coming from both of them. Now he had no choice. He had to help if someone was in danger. But which ride should he try first? If you want Batman to hop aboard the roller coaster, press button three. If you want him to take his chances on the whip, press button four. Press three or four now.
Batman cautiously passed under the sign that read, The Whip. But he couldn't figure out how the Joker would twist that innocent amusement park ride into something evil. Still, the screams of terror coming from down the corridor proved that he had. As the screams became louder, Batman began to run down the hall. Suddenly, he felt a stinging sensation at his back. He turned. A series of leather whips had popped out from the walls and were snapping at him like snakes. Batman backed away from them, moving deeper into the tunnel, and again felt whips snapping against his back. Suddenly, the Joker's voice filled the room. <laughs> I hope you don't mind me being so obvious, Batman. But you know me, I can't resist a bad joke. And I also can't resist giving you the whipping of your life. <laughs> Batman felt one whip slash across his face. Another wrapped around his leg and pulled him to the ground. But Batman knew what to do. All that was needed was a simple knife, which Batman always kept handy in his utility belt. Once he removed it, he began slicing away at the whips. Soon, lifeless leather straps littered the ground. Batman continued through the tunnel until it split off in two directions. Over one path hung a sign that read, The Whip, Honest. Over the other path hung a sign that read, Dunk the Clown. Batman heard screams coming from the direction of the whip. If you think Batman should try to find the real whip ride, press 2. If you think he should see what the Joker's version of Dunk the Clown is, press 4. Press 2 or 4 now. As Batman entered the main room, he could see the small cars on the oval platform and hear the woman's screams. The cars were flying around the track, literally. As each one came around the turn, it rose off the ground and flew by Batman's head. He noticed a head jutting out from one of the cars. It was the woman. Batman leaped onto one of the cars as it zoomed past, then moved from car to car until he was directly behind her. Then the entire ride stopped, and Batman walked over to the woman. Wow, I thought you'd never get here, Bat Guy. Matter of fact, I hoped one of those cars would clobber you. This was no ordinary woman. It was the Harlequin, Joker's assistant, holding a spray can. Why not try another one of my boss's rides, Bats? I know he's dying to cream you on one of them. Till then, I'll be dishing out the jokes. <laughs> Harlequin sprayed Batman in the face. He began laughing uncontrollably. When the effects of the laughing gas wore off, Harlequin was gone. Batman wandered through the amusement park. He had been through most of the rides by now, and although the Joker had until now managed to escape him, Batman felt he was close to getting what he came for. Soon the Joker would be out of tricks and out of luck. But judging from the light in the distance, Batman figured the Joker had one more crooked hand to play. As Batman came closer to the light, he began to understand what it was. There before him was an enormous tent. Where all the other amusements he'd visited so far had been dark and gloomy, this tent was alive with colorful lights. The sound of music blasted from inside. He could hear the sounds of pinball machines and video games. Over the tent door hung a brightly colored neon sign that contained the single word, Arcade. Batman breathed deeply. Okay, Joker. Here I am. Then he stepped inside. Inside the tent, Batman was confronted by four doors. He had come to expect some kind of advanced warning of the type of terror awaiting him in each ride. But these doors simply had the numbers one through four printed on them. There was no clue as to what manner of trap would be on the other side. Batman stood outside the four doors and scratched his head. This was the toughest choice of all. Choose a door, caped crusader. But remember, you only get one choice. Step into a room and there's no turning back. Yeah! That's it then. Choose a number, any number. But remember what the Joker said. Once you choose, there's no turning back. 
Choose number one, two, three, or four now. Batman stepped through the door and onto a vast, slightly tilted plane. He noticed the floor below him was as smooth as glass and had colorful designs painted all along the surface. Scattered across the floor were strange objects that looked like huge metal mushrooms. The tops of the mushrooms glowed brightly. Along the sides of the plane, Batman noticed large triangular boxes that were surrounded by huge rubber bands. Try as he might, Batman couldn't figure out what he'd walked into. Okay, Joker, I give up. What is this place? The voice of the Joker filled the air. Can't you guess? No? Well, you'll figure it out sooner or later. Have a ball! <laughs> Batman heard the sound of metal rolling against the wood. Then he felt a rumbling sound. It got stronger and stronger. And when Batman looked into the distance, he could see a huge steel ball rolling down the plane toward him. I can't believe it. I'm in the middle of a giant-sized pinball game. Batman watched as the ball bounced off the mushroom-shaped bumpers, metal spinners, and flashing lights, picking up speed as it came close. He tried to flee, but before he could move, the ball smashed into him. Batman awoke to darkness. He couldn't see an inch in front of his face. He groped around in the darkness until he felt a smooth, cool wall. He pressed his ear against it, but could hear nothing. Then he tapped on the wall. It sounded like it was made of solid steel. After a few moments, he got to his feet and felt along the wall. He wanted to get a better idea of where he was. All he could determine in the darkness was that he was in a steel box around 10 feet long. The crunching sound he made every time he took a step told him there were scraps of paper all along the wall. Suddenly, a rectangle of light about the size of a mailbox slot appeared on the opposite wall. Sunlight streamed in. Then a pair of evil green eyes appeared behind the slot. It was the Joker. Uh-oh, looks like Batman's in real trouble. I bet he can really use your help right now. What would you do in a situation like this? If you think Batman should make a leap for the Joker, press button one. If you think he should reach for a weapon in his utility belt, press button two. Or if you think he should do nothing, press button three. Press one, two, or three now. Batman could see the Joker's eyes crinkle with glee. The Joker was really enjoying this. Well, let him, Batman thought, as he slowly reached for his utility belt. Batman felt for the belt, but it was gone. Through the narrow slot, Batman watched the Joker dangling it merrily. Looking for this, Bats? I always wondered if you wore it to keep your pants up. Guess not! <laughs> I guess it's safe to tell you what I'm up to, Batman, because I'm certain there's nothing you can do about it. You see, about a year ago, I had this wonderful idea to buy a carnival. What better way for a fella like me to spread joy to the world? So I approached the Bronsky brothers and made them an offer they couldn't refuse. Since then, me and my boys have been touring the country, entertaining the public while robbing their banks. And then a few weeks ago, I, the genius that I am, thought to myself, why go to the trouble of going all the way into town to rob their banks when they're going to come here anyway? So I set up all those rides you sampled a while ago, Bat Boy, and when the carnival opens in a few hours and the public lines up at the gates to get in, they'll never know what hit them. <laughs> Batman was furious. He clutched at the papers scattered around him and shook them angrily at the Joker. 
Oh, Bats, I just love it when you act like a true superhero. Sit tight and keep an ear out. If you listen hard enough, you should be able to hear the screams of innocent customers. <laughs> Then the Joker shut the tiny slot, and Batman was once again plunged into darkness. But not before he recognized what he was holding in his hand. A pile of crisp hundred-dollar bills. Now he knew where he was. Inside the armored car the Joker had stolen, with all the money. As he sat in the darkness, Batman wondered how he could use this information to his advantage. Just then, Batman remembered something else the tiny walkie-talkie he always kept inside his boot. He removed it, and although it was dark, managed to switch the tiny communicator on. Alfred, are you there? Sir? Oh, oh dear, sir. It's 8 a.m. I must have fallen asleep at the console. Are you in trouble? Actually, Alfred, I've just figured out what I'm in. Now I've got to figure out what I'm going to do about it. But in the meantime, I know the Joker's planning a major disaster for the carnival goers today. And I need to make sure he never pulls it off. I see. Shall I summon the authorities? Or would you rather speak to the boy, Wonder? Good question, Alfred. Well, what would you do? If you want to call the police and let them know what's going on at the Joker's Carnival, press 1. To call Robin and get his help, press 4. Press 1 or 4 now. Batman's walkie-talkie transmitted to the phone on Commissioner Gordon's desk. This was a special phone, reserved for use by Batman only, and Gordon had been up all night waiting for it to ring. He thought Batman might be in trouble. As a matter of fact, Commissioner, I am. But I can deal with my problem, I think. It's innocent lives I'm worried about here. The Bronski Brothers Carnival. You've got to make sure no one attends it. It's a front for the Joker. He's planning to rob all the visitors to the carnival as soon as they... Yes, we know about it. One of our detectives, Harry Bullock, did a bit of investigating and discovered the Joker's connection to the carnival and the armored car heist. We've kept all civilians clear of the area. Naturally, Bullock wants us to storm the place, but I was waiting to see what you had in mind. Batman paced back and forth in the tiny room, kicking hundred-dollar bills about as he planned his next move. He knew that he might be able to stop the Joker himself if he could only get out of the armored car jail. Commissioner, I think I have the solution. Have your men gather out of sight, just beyond the carnival's parking lot. I'll signal you when it's time for them to move in. Batman knew he had two choices. He could set fire to the money all around him. Even the Joker would open the door if he knew all his cash was going up in flames. On the other hand, he could use the special frequency on his walkie-talkie to call for the Batmobile. Batman calculated that he could set it on a collision course with the armored car. If he hit it just right, like the precise billiard shots Bruce Wayne used to win the Gotham City Athletic Club Championship, the door would go flying. Talk about big decisions. This one is really a matter of life or death for Batman. It's up to you to decide. So which is it going to be? Press 3 to summon the Batmobile, or press 4 to heat up some of the Joker's cold cash. Press 3 or 4 now. Batman switched off the walkie-talkie and flipped it over to open the battery compartment. He removed the battery and touched it against the armored car's steel walls. Batman knew that the tip of the battery would heat up as the charge ran out. When it was good and hot, he touched it against one of the dollar bills. For a moment, he could see nothing, but he could smell burning paper. Then the bill caught fire, and the entire room was lit by a warm red glow. Carefully, he made his way to the closed slot on the wall and knocked on it. Harlequin sat behind the wheel of the armored car. The Joker had told her to keep watch on Batman to make sure he didn't try anything funny. Harlequin was hoping he would, but she'd heard nothing at all. Frankly, the whole sitting guard thing was one big bore. She wanted to be where the action was, on the midway with the Joker and his crew. But she had her orders. So she sat behind the wheel of the car, 
popping open the compartments of Batman's utility belt that the Joker had snatched off Batman and absently left behind. Suddenly, she heard a tapping on the wall behind her. Anyone out there? Harlequin smiled as she turned toward the little slot on the wall. Batman was probably going to beg her to let him out. She bet he would try to make her feel guilty about what the Joker was planning and try to appeal to her conscience. Ha! Batman would say anything to get out of that box. Harlequin reached for the sliding door and opened it. She was about to tell Batman to shut up when a burning hundred dollar bill shot out of the peephole. It was quickly followed by another and another. The Harlequin's eyes widened in terror. There's plenty more where that came from, Harlequin. Harlequin panicked. The Joker would kill her if she let Batman burn up all their loot. She leaped from the driver's seat and ran to the back of the armored car. She grabbed the door handle and turned it slightly. From the inside of the car, Batman kicked the door open with all of his strength. The door swung out, smacking Harlequin in the head and knocking her out cold. Batman lifted her into the car and closed the door behind her, locking her inside. The fire was out. It would be a safe prison. Then Batman turned to look over the carnival area in the distance. Well, Batman's free at last. I think it's just about time for Batman to wrap up this adventure. The only question is how. Should Batman try to find the Joker on foot? Or should he get behind the wheel of the armored car and track down his most dangerous foe that way? The choice is yours. Press 1 to have Batman hunt the Joker on foot. Press 3 to have him use the armored car. Press 1 or 3 now. Batman hopped into the Batmobile and revved the engine. The amazing car took off with a start, roaring toward the main carnival grounds. No customers had arrived at the Joker's cruel carnival. In the middle of the main area, a furious Joker fell silent as he heard the sound of the Batmobile in the distance. Then he looked toward the sound and saw it. For a minute, he couldn't believe it. But there it was, the Batmobile. And it was getting closer every second. The Joker rushed to the middle of the carnival grounds and began to scream. He escaped! Somehow, he escaped! And he's coming! He's coming! Get him! The Joker's men all started scurrying about, grabbing deadly missile launchers from their hidden places. The Joker had prepared them for a moment like this. The Batmobile was almost upon them. But when it arrived, they would be ready. They formed a line, each man holding a missile launcher aimed at the Batmobile. Inside the Batmobile, Batman watched as the Joker's men aimed their weapons at him. Batman thought the missiles might actually be powerful enough to damage the bulletproof Batmobile but he did not intend to find out. Just as the Joker's men fired their missiles, Batman turned the steering wheel sharply. The Batmobile screeched to the side, avoiding the missiles and crashing through a nearby tent. The Joker's men were puzzled. What the heck is he doing? I don't know. Maybe he don't know how to drive. But Batman knew how to drive, and he knew exactly what he was doing. As he crashed through the first tent, the Batmobile's razor-sharp wheel blades cut through the main tent pole. The pole began to fall, taking the entire tent down with it. The tough fabric landed on top of the Joker's men, who could not get out of the way in time. Then Batman steered the Batmobile toward the next tent, where he sliced another tent pole. The second fabric tent landed on top of the first, but Batman still was not finished. After a few moments, all the tents were down and all of them had fallen on top of the Joker's men. They were all trapped beneath the billowing fabric of the criminal carnival's tents. Batman pulled the Batmobile up alongside the tents to take a look. He was about to radio Alfred to ask him to call the police when he heard a roaring sound in the distance. He turned to see the armored truck drive off. It was being driven by the Joker. Batman revved up his engines as he took off after the clown prince of crime. In moments, the carnival grounds were far behind him. Now he was speeding down winding roads, driving the Batmobile as fast as he could to catch the Joker. But the Joker had too much of a head start. The armored car disappeared over a hill in the distance. Batman knew his foe had escaped him once more. But then, Batman heard the sound of helicopter blades. And then, rising straight up over the hill, Batman saw a helicopter. A 
familiar voice suddenly came through the Batmobile's radio. This is Robin. Alfred told me you were in trouble, Batman, so I came as soon as I could. The police have the place surrounded. The helicopter continued to rise into the sky. Batman noticed a heavy steel wire was hanging from the bottom of the copter. He said you were looking for the Joker, but you couldn't seem to get your hands on him. The helicopter was higher than ever now, and Batman could see there was a huge metal claw hanging from the bottom of the steel wire. The claw was hooked onto the armored car, and it was floating in the sky. Inside, Batman could see the Joker. The clown, Prince of Crime, was crying as he pulled at his green hair in frustration. Well, I think I found what you were looking for. Thanks, Robin. Drop him anywhere. Uh, only kidding. Nice job. You got Batman through this entire adventure and helped him catch the Joker to boot. Congratulations to you. But your adventure is not over yet. If you want, you can rewind this tape, start all over again, and press different buttons. And if you press different buttons, different things will happen in this story, and different things will happen to Batman. So if you want, you can please rewind this tape now. Thank you for turning me on. This is 2XL, your favorite robot buddy. Remember me? Of course you do. Or do you? You do look a little familiar, but I better check. If you have ever played this program before, press yes. If you have not ever played this program before, press no. Press yes or no now. Aha! Uh -huh. I knew you looked familiar. I just knew it. A robot never forgets, you know. And I hope you have not forgotten how this program works. Remember to follow all of my instructions. Only press the buttons I tell you to, and only press a button after I say the word now. In this action-packed program, you will help guide Batman through an adventure that will pit him against one of his most dangerous enemies. The choices you make will either help the caped crusader or put him into serious danger. It's all up to you. Try not to to make the same choices you did the last time you played this program, because I have many different stories to tell stored deep in my computer memory banks. So many, in fact, that even I, a computer genius, cannot keep track of all of them without some help. Therefore, I've invited a special guest narrator to help tell the story while I keep track of your choices. I'll be back when it's time for you to help decide Batman's fate. But for now, I'll turn you over to our narrator, for the mystery of the criminal carnival. Bruce Wayne was feeling restless. He sat inside his huge library reading a book, but his mind kept wandering. There must be something better to do with his time. He looked out the window into the nighttime sky. Except for the moon and stars, the sky was dark. He began reading again, but a sentence later, he was back looking through the window. It was as if he expected something new to suddenly appear. Alfred, Bruce's faithful butler, entered the room and noticed his boss staring absently into the sky. Looking for something, Master Bruce? A bat signal, perhaps? No. Uh, yes. That's exactly what I was looking for, Alfred. It's been two days since Batman was called on. I can't believe there's no crime to combat in all of Gotham City. Well, sir, if you're so certain there's evil afoot, perhaps it's time for you to change into Batman and take a little spin around town? Or perhaps you'd rather scan the computers in the Batcave? Here is your first chance to determine what Batman does next. If you want Batman to hop into the Batmobile, press button 1. If you want him to scan the computer in the Batcave, press button 2. Press 1 or 2 now. Batman cruised down the streets of Gotham City in the Batmobile. It was late, so the streets were mostly empty. The few remaining people either watched with awe as the Batmobile streaked by, or quickly darted into the shadows to avoid being seen. It was these people, people who had something to hide, that Batman was interested in. 
With the Batmobile's video camera, he shot images of each suspicious character and relayed them back to the Batcave to be compared with the computer's huge file of criminal images. Soon, the computer had a match. That is Lips Logan, just released from jail for armed robbery. Hmm. Logan's with the Joker's gang. Wonder if he's planning something. Suddenly, the bat signal filled the nighttime sky. Only one man had the right to light the beacon to summon Batman, and that was Police Commissioner James Gordon. If he needed Batman's help, it must be important. Hi, I'm back. If you think Batman should go to police headquarters to see Commissioner Gordon, press one. If you want him to follow Lips Logan, press button four. Press button one or four now. The Batmobile sailed through the streets of Gotham. Inside, Batman looked through the rearview mirror. He had the feeling someone was following him. But then, lots of people become curious when they see the Batmobile screeching through the Gotham streets. It was probably nothing. Commissioner Gordon was waiting on the roof of police headquarters when Batman arrived. Glad you could make it, Batman. We have a problem. It's the Joker again, I'm afraid. Made off with an armored car full of cash about an hour ago. If I know the Joker, this is only the beginning. Not if I have anything to say about it. Batman turned away from Commissioner Gordon and stepped off the roof ledge. With his batarang, he swooped down to the street where the Batmobile was waiting. Yo, Batman, fancy meeting you here. It was Harry Bullock, one of Batman's least favorite detectives on the Gotham City Police Force. Batman disliked Harry, both for his attitude and his methods. Oddly enough, Harry felt the same way about Batman. Still, Harry actually seemed happy to see Batman at the moment. Hate to admit it, Bats, but I got a problem and I could uh, use your help. There's a flying armored car I'm after, and the Joker took it. Without saying a word, Batman opened the roof of the Batmobile and hopped inside. Then he started the engine. Wait a second. We've got to make a decision for Batman here before the Batmobile speeds away. Hurry now. The Batmobile's engines are revving up. If you think Batman would be better off if he teamed up with Harry Bullock, press 2. But if you think Batman should go it alone, press 3. Press 2 or 3. Now. Batman parked the Batmobile in a wooded area just outside the entrance and scanned the grounds of the Bronsky Brothers Carnival. It seemed quiet enough right now. Batman radioed Alfred to get some information. Alfred, get me everything you can on the Bronsky Brothers Carnival. Is it a front for a criminal operation or is it legitimate? Certainly, sir. You'll have to wait a moment for that information, though. Would you like to hear the computer's file on the Joker while you wait? Or would you prefer to listen to Bruce Wayne's telephone messages? Hmm, this is a tough question. Learning more about the Joker might be very helpful in this adventure. But you never know which interesting people might leave messages on Bruce Wayne's answering machine. If you choose to hear about the Joker, press 3. But if you're curious about Bruce Wayne's personal life and would rather hear his telephone messages, press 4. Press 3 or 4 now. Batman opened the sliding rooftop door. All right, Bullock. Come on in. Harry smiled and reached over to grab the Batmobile's hood. With great effort, he tried to heft himself up into the cockpit. He huffed and puffed, and after a few minutes, gave up. <laughs> Ow! Whoa, oh, gee. Oh, sorry, Bats. No can do. You know, for such a big car, you'd think you'd have more comfy interior. I think it's you who's a little too comfy, Bullock. Maybe you'd be better off following me after all. And when this adventure is over, try watching what you eat and exercising a little. As the Batmobile screeched down the Gotham City streets, Bullock raced back to his own car and took off after it. Within moments, the Batmobile's radar had located the balloon carrying the armored car, and Batman and Bullock followed it to the Bronsky Brothers Carnival site on the edge of town. Both watched 
as the armored car slowly floated to the ground. There she is, Bats. I'm going in. Oh, boy. This could be a problem for Batman. Harry Bullock can be a very stubborn detective. You should press 1 if you want Batman to tell Harry to wait for him to check out the carnival with his night vision glasses. Or press 2 if you want Batman to let Harry go in. Press 1 or 2 now. <laughs> Wait a second, Bullock. You can't just storm in there. Let me look the place over first. It might be filled with traps. Batman put on his night vision goggles and looked around. Sure enough, the grounds were littered with deadly mines. No car could cross the parking area and make it to the carnival site without getting blown to bits. All right, now what? Now we get out of our cars and go in by foot. Batman and Bullock slowly made their way to the park entrance. Since he was still wearing his special goggles, Batman could see all the mines planted along the path, and the two easily made their way to the carnival grounds. But once they arrived, both Batman and Bullock were stunned. This carnival was like none they'd ever seen before. It was as if every carnival ride idea had been turned upside down and inside out. Instead of a tunnel of love, Batman and Bullock saw a tunnel of hate. Instead of a merry-go-round, there was a misery-go-round. There were dozens of attractions here, each more hideous and terrible than the other. Should Batman and Bullock enter the misery-go-round or the tunnel of hate? Press 1 to go for a ride on the misery-go-round or 2 to enter the tunnel of hate. Press 1 or 2 now. <laughs> Batman and Bullock stepped onto the tent that contained the misery-go-round. Instead of the brightly colored wooden horses you'd expect to find on a normal merry-go-round, the misery-go-round was filled with evil-looking monsters, with sharp claws and even sharper fangs. Batman thought he saw someone standing by the huge pipe organ in the center of the ride and moved toward him. Just then, the misery-go-round started to move with Batman and Bullock on it. Around and around the spinning platform went, faster and faster. The music grew louder, faster and scarier with it. The figure in the middle of the misery-go-round was a blur. The platform was moving too quickly for Batman or Bullock to see who it was. Batman could still guess that the Joker was the villain at the controls, but that was the least of his problems. Right now, just hanging onto the fanged wooden gremlin was his greatest concern. He looked over his shoulder at the tent walls surrounding the misery-go-round. For the first time, he saw that the walls were lined with deadly, sharp spikes. Why hadn't he noticed them before? The misery-go-round was spinning so fast, if he let go now, he'd fly right into the wall. Batman! Help me! Batman turned to see Harry Bullock. His feet were up in the air, his hands tightly clutching a ponytail of werewolf fur. If he let go, he'd be Swiss cheese. Batman reached into his utility belt and slowly removed his batarang. He tied the rope end around the gremlin's head that he was clinging to and threw the batarang end toward the tent wall. The batarang hooked onto one of the spikes and the entire misery-go-round came to a grinding halt. When Batman looked to the organ at the center of the platform, he saw the face of the Joker. You've made nice work of my misery go round, Batman, but there's more delicious traps to come. And next time, you won't be so lucky to loo. <laughs> Before Batman could make a move, the Joker dropped through a trap door and disappeared. Batman turned to Bullock. The big detective looked like he was sick as he staggered to his feet. Sorry, Bats, but I'm out of my league here. Any luck, I'll be back with help. Till then, you're on your own. Batman watched as Bullock staggered off. Hopefully, he'd capture the Joker alone. But right now, he wasn't too certain. Batman stood alone and unafraid in the center of the carnival. Once again, he put on his night vision goggles to see through the darkness. He noticed the entrances to two different carnival rides around him. Each ride had its name over the entrance, 
but each name had been changed into something twisted and frightening by the Joker. On Batman's left, he could see that the bumper car ride had been changed into the dumper cars. On his right, he noticed that the fun house was now called the sad house. If he was going to find the Joker, he had to try one or the other. If you want Batman to decide to enter the dumper cars ride, press button three. If you think he'll have more luck inside the sad house, press four. Press three or four now. Batman walked under the sign that read dumper cars and walked down a dark corridor. At the end of the hallway was a large room with what looked like a huge oval skating rink in the center. The rink was so large, Batman could not see the other side. A single small electric car waited near Batman. Batman looked at it. On the seat was a handwritten message that read, Hop in. No way. That's just what the Joker wants. Gah! Suddenly, Batman felt a jolt of electricity through his feet. He looked down. The floor was electrified. Sparks ran along the floor, streaming up toward Batman's feet. Batman jumped out of the way of most of the sparks, but couldn't avoid them all. In pain, he jumped into the small bumper car. He had no choice. As soon as he was behind the wheel, the tiny car took off with a jolt. Caught by surprise, Batman dropped his night vision glasses to the ground. The car sped into the darkness and zigzagged crazily across the electrified floor for what seemed like a long, long time. Batman wondered what the Joker was up to. He wondered how a ride in a bumper car, no matter how rough, could possibly hurt him. He wondered until he felt his little car get smashed in the side. The impact was so strong, Batman was almost shaken out of the car, but he held on. Then he heard laughter in the darkness. Not the Joker's laughter, but the sinister cackling of a woman. Before he could think about who the Joker's new partner in crime was, Batman's car was smashed into again, this time from the other side. Again, Batman was almost shaken loose, but this time, he hardly had the chance to settle down into his seat before he was smashed into again, and this time it was a head-on collision. This last crash was too much for the little car. It sizzled and sputtered and came to a halt. I'm a sitting duck now for sure. What I need is some lights to even things up a bit. Light? Did somebody ask for lights? <laughs> okay, you got them. Lights, camera, action. The room suddenly came alive with light. Enormous spotlights lit up the entire room. For the first time, Batman could see he was surrounded by smashed bumper cars, all of which were being controlled by the Harlequin, the Joker's sidekick, who sat in a chair outside the rink, giggling. Hiya, Batman. How's it going? Hope you're feeling nice and cozy in that dumper car, because I got a friend who's just dying to dump you. Batman knew that friend was the Joker, but where was he hiding? Batman had heard the maniac's voice just a moment before, but right now he was nowhere to be seen. The Harlequin waved at Batman, turned, and began to skip out of the room. Batman tried to get out of the little car to catch her, but he couldn't. With all the smashing and crashing and bumping, Batman's legs were stuck in the car. He was trapped. And now it's time you find out why <laughs> we call them dumper cars. Batman heard a rumbling sound. It got louder and louder, and then a huge eight-wheel monster truck came smashing into the room. Batman could see the Joker behind the wheel laughing hysterically as the truck ran over car after car, leaving each flat as a pancake as it came closer and closer to Batman. Batman had to act quickly. He fired a wrist dart straight at the ceiling of the room. The dart was attached to an extra strong wire attached to Batman's utility belt. When Batman pressed a button on the belt, the wire pulled both Batman and the car straight up into the sky. As the monster truck approached, Batman started swinging back and forth in the air and crashed the bumper car right through the Joker's windshield. 
the Joker leaped from the truck, and as Batman finally managed to wriggle free of the bumper car, turned off all the lights. Batman stumbled around in the darkness until he found a door that led back onto the carnival's midway. He'd missed getting the Joker for now, but knew he'd get another chance. As Batman emerged from the ride, he came into an open area that announced two new attractions. On the left was a sign with an arrow pointing into the darkness. Originally, it had said, Roller Coaster, but someone had changed it to Roll Over Coaster. On the right was a sign that read simply, The Whip. Batman recalled that ride from his youth, but he knew that with the Joker in charge, it would be very different from the ride he remembered. Batman decided he wasn't going to try either of these rides. But then, he heard the sound of a woman's screams coming from both of them. Now he had no choice. He had to help if someone was in danger. But which ride should he try first? If you want Batman to hop aboard the roller coaster, press button three. If you want him to take his chances on the whip, press button four. Press three or four now. Batman raced through the entrance to the rollover coaster just in time. The 10-car roller coaster train had almost pulled away from the gate when Batman leaped aboard the last car. As the roller coaster reached the top of the first hill, Batman noticed a female form in the first car. Although it was difficult to see in the moonlight, her arms were tight against her sides, as though she were strapped down in her seat. Suddenly, the woman began to scream. Hang on, miss. I'm on my way. As the roller coaster came speeding down the first hill, Batman began climbing over the seats toward the lead car. The wind in his face was terrific. The speed of the roller coaster made each move incredibly difficult. The roller coaster suddenly turned left. Batman felt himself being torn from the coaster by the pressure and speed, but he held on. Inch by inch, he dragged himself forward. The screams of terror coming from the woman ahead gave him the strength to continue. Finally, he managed to climb to the front car and sit down next to the woman. It's okay now, miss. I'm here. The woman stopped screaming and began to giggle. <laughs> In the moonlight, Batman finally got a good look at her. This was no ordinary citizen in trouble. This was the Harlequin, the Joker's number one assistant. She giggled happily as she pointed ahead. Don't look now, Batman, but you're about to be Swiss cheesed. Batman glanced ahead and couldn't believe his eyes. The car was headed right toward a wall of spikes that had been placed directly in the path of the roller coaster. Are you crazy, Harlequin? We're both as good as dead. Not necessarily, Batman. Time for me to take off and time for you to roll over and play dead. With that, the Harlequin pressed a button on the side of her seat and her chair began to rocket skyward. Thinking quickly, Batman grabbed onto the chair and both of them shot straight up into the sky. An instant later, the roller coaster smashed into the wall of spikes. Let go, you big ape, let go! High up in the air, the Harlequin kicked at Batman as she tried to pry his fingers loose from the seat. Finally, she punched him hard enough and Batman let go. Happy landings! <laughs> But Batman knew what he had to do if he was going to survive a fall from this height. Grabbing both ends of his cape tightly, he created a parachute. And like the bat he was named after, slowly glided back down to the carnival. From the ground, he watched as the Harlequin floated down on a parachute of her own toward the other side of the park. He couldn't do anything about her just now, but sooner or later he would. He was determined to stop both her and the Joker, no matter what the cost. Batman wandered through the amusement park. He had been through most of the rides by now, and although the Joker had until now managed to escape him, Batman felt he was close to getting what he came for. Soon the Joker would be out of tricks and out of luck. But judging from the light in the distance, Batman figured the Joker had one more crooked hand to play. 
As Batman came closer to the light, he began to understand what it was. There before him was an enormous tent. Where all the other amusements he'd visited so far had been dark and gloomy, this tent was alive with colorful lights. The sound of music blasted from inside. He could hear the sounds of pinball machines and video games. Over the tent door hung a brightly colored neon sign that contained the single word, Arcade. Batman breathed deeply. Okay, Joker. Here I am. Then he stepped inside. Inside the tent, Batman was confronted by four doors. He had come to expect some kind of advanced warning of the type of terror awaiting him in each ride. But these doors simply had the numbers one through four printed on them. There was no clue as to what manner of trap would be on the other side. Batman stood outside the four doors and scratched his head. This was the toughest choice of all. Choose a door, caked crusader. But remember, you only get one choice. Step into a room, and there's no turning back. Yeah! That's it, then. Choose a number, any number. But remember what the Joker said. Once you choose, there's no turning back. Choose number one, two, three, or four now. <laughs> Batman stepped through the door and dropped into a shallow pool of water. Drenched, he stood up, shook some of the water off, and continued forward. There was a huge television screen in front of him. For a moment, it was dark, but then it came alive with color. Walking plants, biting fishes, and talking, fighting dragons of every shape and color filled the screen as a voice boomed from it. Hurry, hurry, hurry! Welcome to the world of Super Bartholomew Brothers, the video game that puts you in the picture. And now get ready to meet the stars of our show, Giuseppe and Bartholomew, Bartholomew! Batman stood open-mouthed as two strange human characters appeared on the screen. One was short and fat, the other tall and skinny. Both were dressed in handyman outfits. They waved to Batman and stepped forward, right out of the screen. Hi, Batman. Glad to meet you. Shake. Batman was too confused to refuse. He reached out, extending a wet glove to the video Bartholomew brother. As soon as he touched the animated character's hand, an electric charge shot through Batman's body, knocking him out cold. Don't you know, you shouldn't touch live electrical appliances with wet hands? <laughs> Batman awoke to darkness. He couldn't see an inch in front of his face. He groped around in the darkness until he felt a smooth, cool wall. He pressed his ear against it, but could hear nothing. Then he tapped on the wall. It sounded like it was made of solid steel. After a few moments, he got to his feet and felt along the wall. He wanted to get a better idea of where he was. All he could determine in the darkness was that he was in a steel box around 10 feet long. The crunching sound he made every time he took a step told him there were scraps of paper all along the wall. Suddenly, a rectangle of light about the size of a mailbox slot appeared on the opposite wall. Sunlight streamed in. Then, a pair of evil green eyes appeared behind the slot. It was the Joker. Uh-oh. Looks like Batman's in real trouble. I bet he can really use your help right now. What would you do in a situation like this? If you think Batman should make a leap for the Joker, press button one. If you think he should reach for a weapon in his utility belt, press button two. Or if you think he should do nothing, press button three. Press one, two, or three now. Batman leaped across the tight, dark room toward the slot. The Joker stepped back and laughed as he raised a colorful plastic flower up to the hole. Batman saw a gush of liquid squirt from the flower's center and stepped out of its path before it could touch him. It hit the ground and sizzled. Acid. 
Don't push your luck, Bats. Now sit down and listen up, unless you'd like an acid shampoo. I guess it's safe to tell you what I'm up to, Batman, because I'm certain there's nothing you can do about it. You see, about a year ago, I had this wonderful idea to buy a carnival. What better way for a fella like me to spread joy to the world? So I approached the Bronsky brothers and made them an offer they couldn't refuse. Since then, me and my boys have been touring the country, entertaining the public while robbing their banks. And then a few weeks ago, I, the genius that I am, thought to myself, why go to the trouble of going all the way into town to rob their banks when they're going to come here anyway? So I set up all those rides you sampled a while ago, Bat Boy. And when the carnival opens in a few hours and the public lines up at the gates to get in, they'll never know what hit them. <laughs> Batman was furious. He clutched at the papers scattered around him and shook them angrily at the Joker. Oh, Bats, I just love it when you act like a true superhero. Sit tight and keep an ear out. If you listen hard enough, you should be able to hear the screams of innocent customers. <laughs> then the Joker shut the tiny slot, and Batman was once again plunged into darkness. But not before he recognized what he was holding in his hand. A pile of crisp hundred-dollar bills. Now he knew where he was, inside the armored car the Joker had stolen, with all the money. As he sat in the darkness, Batman wondered how he could use this information to his advantage. Just then, Batman remembered something else. The tiny walkie-talkie he always kept inside his boot. He removed it, and although it was dark, managed to switch the tiny communicator on. Alfred, are you there? Sir? <sighs> must have fallen asleep at the console. Are you in trouble? Actually, Alfred, I've just figured out what I'm in. Now I've got to figure out what I'm going to do about it. But in the meantime, I know the Joker's planning a major disaster for the carnival goers today. And I need to make sure he never pulls it off. I see. Shall I summon the authorities? Or would you rather speak to the boy, Wonder? Good question, Alfred. Well, what would you do? If you want to call the police and let them know what's going on at the Joker's Carnival, press 2. To call Robin and get his help, press 3. Press 2 or 3 now. Batman's walkie-talkie transmitted to the phone on Commissioner Gordon's desk. This was a special phone, reserved for use by Batman only, and Gordon had been up all night waiting for it to ring. He thought Batman might be in trouble. As a matter of fact, Commissioner, I am. But I can deal with my problem, I think. It's innocent lives I'm worried about here. The Bronsky Brothers Carnival. You've got to make sure no one attends it. It's a front for the Joker. He's planning to rob all the visitors to the carnival as soon as they... Yes, we know about it. One of our detectives, Harry Bullock, did a bit of investigating and discovered the Joker's connection to the carnival and the armored car heist. We've kept all civilians clear of the area. Naturally, Bullock wants us to storm the place, but I was waiting to see what you had in mind. Batman paced back and forth in the tiny room, kicking hundred-dollar bills about as he planned his next move. He knew that he might be able to stop the Joker himself if he could only get out of the armored car jail. Commissioner, I think I have the solution. Have your men gather out of sight, just beyond the carnival's parking lot. I'll signal you when it's time for them to move in. Batman knew he had two choices. He could set fire to the money all around him. Even the Joker would open the door if he knew all his cash was going up in flames. On the other hand, he could use the special frequency on his walkie-talkie to call for the Batmobile. Batman calculated that he could set it on a collision course with the armored car. If he hit it just right, like the precise billiard shots Bruce Wayne used to win the Gotham City Athletic Club Championship, the door would go flying. 
talk about big decisions. This one is really a matter of life or death for Batman. It's up to you to decide. So which is it going to be? Press 3 to summon the Batmobile. Or press 4 to heat up some of the Joker's cold cash. Press 3 or 4 now. Batman told Alfred to continue trying to get in touch with Robin. Then he switched off the walkie-talkie and fumbled with it in the darkness until he felt its frequency dial. He twisted the dial all the way to the right, remembering that this was the special frequency he used to signal for the Batmobile. Just outside the carnival grounds, hidden behind a line of trees, the Batmobile stirred. First, its light went on. Then its engine turned over and began to purr. At first, it sounded like nothing more than a contented cat. But the engine grew louder and louder until it began to sound like a savage lion. That man's voice could be heard from the speaker inside the amazing automobile. Batmobile, begin high-speed search sequence. Track, signal origination point. Begin in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. The Batmobile's tires squealed as it tore through the woods toward its destination. Meanwhile, Harlequin sat at the wheel of the armored car, lazily examining the compartments of the utility belt the Joker had taken off Batman, before tossing him into the tiny room behind her. The Joker had instructed her to make certain Batman didn't try to escape. So far, she thought, this job is a piece of cake. But then she heard Batman's voice from inside the small room. Hey, who are you talking to in there? Harlequin turned to face the closed slot that looked into the armored car's storage room. She slid open the male slot-sized door and peered inside. There she could see Batman, his back pressed against the wall, as if he were bracing himself for a terrible jolt. He looked straight into Harlequin's eyes, and Harlequin thought she saw him almost smile. You know you're going to lose, don't you? Harlequin began to laugh. But just then, she heard a screech of tires and the roar of a powerful engine. She turned to see where it was coming from, and when The Batmobile smashed into the side of the armored car. Harlequin flew to the ground as the armored car was lifted into the air and came down with a crash. The back door sprung open, sending millions of dollars billowing out into the air. When the paper money finally settled to the ground, Batman was free. He picked the groggy Harlequin up, locked her in the armored car, and began walking toward the carnival grounds. Oh boy, now what should that man do? Should he hop into the Batmobile or search for the Joker on foot? Either way, I think the Joker's goose is about to be cooked. But it's up to you. Press 2 to use the Batmobile. Press 4 to go by foot. Press 2 or 4 now. <laughs> As Batman walked away from the armored car, he noticed his utility belt lying on the ground nearby. The Joker must have left it there, never for a minute thinking that Batman could be able to retrieve it. As Batman buckled the belt back onto his waist, he knew that leaving the belt behind would turn out to be the Joker's biggest mistake of the day. With all the belt's gadgets once again at Batman's disposal, the Joker wouldn't stand a chance. The Joker whistled to himself as he happily skipped across the carnival grounds toward the main entrance. He nodded and waved happily to all his crooked employees as he passed. It was a beautiful day. He'd finally managed to capture Batman, and pretty soon he'd be robbing hundreds of innocent fun seekers. It doesn't get any better than this! <laughs> But as the Joker came closer to the entrance, his smile faded. There, standing at the entrance, waiting to buy their admission tickets, was not a thousand, not a hundred, not even a dozen families. There was no one waiting in line. The Joker turned to the creepy-looking ticket seller who stood just inside the gate. The ticket seller shivered with fear when he saw how furious the Joker looked. What is going on here? Uh, I don't know, boss. Maybe it was the Batman. Maybe he tipped off the cops. 
Batman. He's ruined my plans for the last time. I knew I should have knocked him off when I had the chance. And I won't be making the same mistake again. The Joker removed a canister of acid from his pocket and attached it to his squirting flower. Then he turned back toward the ticket taker. Tell the boys to pitch the tents. We're leaving Gotham just as soon as I go back to that armored car and finish off that fat creep. With that, the Joker stormed off in the direction of the armored car. By now, Batman had made his way toward the main carnival tent. He was looking over the scene, trying to figure out the best way to capture the dozen men working to pack up the rides and games of the Joker's twisted show. But as hard as he looked, he could not see the Joker himself until Batman happened to glance back at the armored car, only to see the Joker angrily storming toward it. He must have suspected something. Batman moved after him, but then noticed the canister of acid in his hand. Hmm. This won't be as easy as I hoped. I can't just go after him and risk getting sprayed by his acid. I'll have to wait till the time is right. In moments, that time had come. The Joker approached the armored car and noticed something was wrong. Harlequin was gone. He told her to guard the money and the bat. Where was she? He looked around the van. He looked under it, on top of it, but she was nowhere to be found. Then the Joker heard a sound coming from inside the armored car. It was a soft, groaning sound, not the sound he'd expect Batman to make. He put his ear against the armored car to listen. It was Harlequin. Angrily, he moved to the back of the armored car and flung open the doors. Harlequin sat huddled in the opposite corner. When she saw the Joker, she looked frightened. He, he, he tricked me, Joker, honest. I'll deal with you later, Harley. Right now, all I want to know is, where is he? In answer, Harlequin looked past the Joker and pointed out the door. The Joker looked confused a moment and turned just as Batman leaped at the Clown Prince of Crime and hurled him into the car. As the Joker landed in a heap next to his assistant, Batman slammed the armored car door shut. Batman sat behind the armored car's steering wheel and stormed through the carnival gates. Once safely out of reach of the Joker's men, he used his walkie-talkie to radio Commissioner Gordon. You can pick up the Joker's men whenever you like, Commissioner. I've got the grand prize and his assistant locked up tight as a drum. Nice job. You got Batman through this entire adventure and helped him catch the Joker to boot. Congratulations to you. But your adventure is not over yet. If you want, you can rewind this tape, start all over again, and press different buttons. And if you press different buttons, different things will happen in this story and different things will happen to Batman. So if you want, you can please rewind this tape now.